Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon. Um, it's another very warm day in the Willamette Valley, and I hope you all are staying cool in your area. We have four presenters in this session. Um, we have Dr. Mary Ellen Delostrido, the Director of Research at OSU eCampus, and we have Tian Hong Shi, Susan Fei, and Heather Garcia, who are instructional designers at eCampus. Um, some of you might, might have already attended Dr. Delostrido's session this morning. If you did, welcome back. And I hope this session will give you a different perspective on the work that the OSU eCampus e team has done. Um, if you missed this morning's session, you can check it out uh, off of the recording on our website once we have this published. Same as usual, your mics are all muted during the presentation, but we always welcome your participation in the Q&A and chat. Um, Okay, I am going to mute myself now and turn it back over to our presenters. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mary Ellen Delostrito. I'm the director of the eCampus Research Unit, uh, and I'm happy to be here with my instructional designer colleagues, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, and we're going to be talking about instructional designers and faculty partnerships in online teaching research. Uh, on our title slide, you can see our address to the main uh, research unit uh, website if you're interested in finding out more about what we do. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about our uh, research fellows program and how our instructional designers have been uh, a part of our research fellows program. So let me, um, uh, let me give you just the title slide here with the names and headshots and you will see each of these panelists later. Um, these are our three what we call instructional designer fellows who have joined our program. And on the screen here you will see um, the uh, title of the project that they were a part of. Um, Susan Fine was a part of the 2018 cohort of our fellows program and the title of the project she worked on is Evaluating the Efficacy of Teaching Field-Based Science Online. Um, her cohort has come to an end of their research project, so she is um, a past instructional designer fellow, as we might call her. And then Tian Hong, she is uh, the 2019 instructional designer fellow. She's in the 2019 cohort. The project that she's working on is Breaking Barriers, Evaluating Online Education Platforms to Connect Students with Remote Research Opportunities. Um, and uh, the 2019 cohort is still in progress, finishing up their work. And Heather Garcia is our 2020 Instructional Designer Fellow, and that is a cohort that has just begun at, uh, in January of 2020. And the project that she's working on is called Impacting the Inclusivity Mindset of Online Computer Science Students. So you're gonna hear more from each of these uh, panelists um, in, later in the presentation. What I'm going to begin with is an overview of the program that they are a part of to give you um, some background and some understanding about what that program is and also why we have our instructional designers uh, involved in this particular program. So let me tell you just a little bit about the eCampus Research Unit. The eCampus Research Unit is engaged in um, national and local studies on online education. Uh, and we also support the work of other uh, researchers, faculty, et cetera, on online and hybrid education. And the Research Fellows Program is a piece of that that I will talk about in a moment. Um, and one of the things that is uh, kind of a pillar of the research unit at eCampus is that we like to be focused on what we call actionable research. Um, and, and many we, we um, handle this in many different ways. Our research fellows program focuses on that. Our own research focuses on that. Um, and we also develop research tools so that we can um, encourage what we call actionable research. So using research appropriately to make decisions, um, being informed in, in our decision making. And so one of our studies that we did that was a national study is shown here on the screen. It was called Research Preparation and Engagement of Instructional Designers in U.S. Higher Education. And some of you uh, may have uh, seen that study and or some of you may even have been participants in that study. And this was a uh, national survey that we sent out 
to instructional designers across the country, um, asking them about their interest in and their preparation for their experiences in terms of research and higher education. And it was a really wonderful study. We got a lot of great participation from people across the country. And one of the recommendations um, that we, we had in that um, study was uh, that we needed to provide opportunities for instructional designers to be involved in research. That study showed that instructional designers were um, in many cases really well positioned to be involved in research and or research instructional designers were very much interested in doing research but one of the barriers was the time and the opportunity to be involved in that research. And so as a research unit we wrote these recommendations and then we had to look inward and say okay what can we do in our unit to promote research literacy to promote opportunity for our own uh, e-campus instructional designers to be involved in research and so we put our minds together and we came up with um, this addition to our research fellows program in which we pair each year an instructional designer with one of our funded fellows um, and created this partnership and this opportunity for instructional designers to contribute to these projects. So that's really what we're here to talk about this afternoon is what uh, has happened in that process. And you'll get to hear from three of our instructional designers who are at different stages uh, and you'll get to hear about their experiences and you'll get to hear about um, what our faculty think uh, about working with instructional designers. So I wanted to give you that kind of background and context as to um, you know, why we did this, why we created this program, and where it fits into our larger unit goals and our, our unit objectives. I also have on the screen here a link to the report, um, Research Preparation and Engagement of Instructional Designers. And so if you are interested in seeing that report, it's available on our website. So I'm going to now take a few minutes just to tell you about the Research Fellows Program as it exists and um, and then we'll talk a little bit further about how the instructional designers have fit into the, the research fellows program. So the eCampus Research Fellows Program uh, is uh, a program in which we fund up to five uh, research projects each year uh, among faculty at OSU. So this is an internal program. And our program goals here are listed on the screen. Our first goal is to fund research that is actionable. As we mentioned, actionable research is our thing. So fund research that is actionable and that impacts student learning online. Our second goal is to promote effective assessment of online learning at the course and program levels at OSU. Our third program goal is to provide resources and support to seed pilot research leading to external grant applications. And our fourth goal is to encourage the development of a robust research pipeline on online teaching and learning uh, at OSU. And so all of these goals are, are significant in and of, them, of themselves in that we, um, you know, we know that there is a lot of room for online and uh, hybrid research. Um, and this is one way that we could take our resources as eCampus and we're a small unit, we, we can't do all the studies ourselves. And this is a way to um, support faculty who want to do what we often refer to as the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, there often are fewer funding sources for such things and there often is less, less support for these things. So we supply or we um, fund five projects, as I said, up to five projects each year and each fellow can apply for up to $20,000. Uh, for a project. Um, and some of these projects are an individual faculty member um, doing a project on their own, and in some cases they are teams. So we've had teams of two and teams of four recently um, submit and be funded um, for their projects. Again, if you go to our ecampus.org and state.edu slash fellows, you can actually go to that page and see um, the four cohorts that we have had. You can see their projects. You can see um, in some cases, some of their proposals uh, and some of their white papers that they've produced. So that's our goal is to, um, you know, be able to support research in online and hybrid education. Um, and what we've been able to do then is to wrap our instructional designers into this uh, program. 
So a little bit more about the program, uh, our overview, our fellows, our, um, our faculty fellows specifically, are asked to produce uh, an IRB approved independent research project. That's the goal here. Uh, and then they publish a white paper that we have published on our website as their final product. Uh, many of them will go on to take their work and present at conferences and also use their work as springboards for other publications, but we only require them to produce a white paper. Um, this program includes what we call a cohort model, and so the funded fellows every year meet about once an academic term. Uh, they meet together, talk about their progress, they share resources, they share uh, tips and tricks, they share trials and tribulations, uh, and, and it's a supportive environment for those folks to um, not only share research practices, but it's been really useful for these uh, folks from across campus, from different colleges and departments to hear about the research that's going on in other places in the university. And then the last thing that we ask them to do is uh, typically do a panel presentation, kind of like what we're doing today, but with the fellows um, at our spring eCampus faculty forum, which is a conference that we have typically each year that unfortunately we didn't have this year because of COVID. Um, but that's our, that's our typical um, set of activities that they're involved in. And as the director of this program, I am their support. I help them with their proposal writing, their IRB applications, their white papers, their program design, et cetera, or their research design. And then on the right side of the slide, I showed you their timeline. So this is a, a, an award that is um, given in December of each year, and the uh, fellows begin in January. Um, they begin their winter term trying to get their studies approved by the IRB, and if they're lucky, they get that done by March. Uh, and then their research period is about 12 months beyond that, and so it goes from um, April through March of the next year. So for example, Heather, who is in the current 2020 cohort, she just began this winter um, and they're working on their research now and their research period will end at about spring break of 2021. Um, that's been our typical pattern uh, over the last few years. There have been lots of interesting delays that has, it has extended that, but that's roughly what we anticipated these projects to be is about 18 months long from um, beginning to white paper uh, production at the end. So that's a little bit uh, of information about the program itself. Um, we, as we, as you saw in 2018, we decided to add this component to the program in which we had um, our course development and training team. We gave them the opportunity to apply for um, the Instructional Designer Fellows Program, and you will hear from the three of them today. And we have also hoped, we hope in the future to have some of our multimedia team members join into a fellows project as well. So it's gonna hopefully move beyond just our instructional design teams. So I'm gonna pause here for just a minute uh, and show us, or show you our contact information uh, if you're interested. Um, and just pause and at, see if there's any questions about the program itself before I go into asking questions of my panelists. Looks like we're good so far. Okay, great. So I'm going to move on now um, to the second part of our presentation and I'm gonna um, stop my sharing here so you can just see our panelists at this point. All right, so what I have is a series of questions that I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to answer. Um, and before I do that, I wanna mention um, the faculty partners that they work with. And we're gonna, toward the end, I'm gonna give you some information from each of the faculty partners. But I thought I would mention before we ask, ask the questions, um, who they are and what departments they're in. And we have fellows from, uh, almost every one of our colleges over the last four years. So uh, the faculty partners are Yvette Gibson from Rangeland Science, Diana Rollman from the College of Public Health, uh, and Laura Lita from Computer Science. So the three uh, fellow partners that you hear today, uh, those are the three departments that they are engaged with in this research process. 
So I'm going to begin um, by asking them uh, about their interest in becoming a, an Instructional Designer Fellow. So I'm going to start with Susan. So Susan, why were you interested in being a CDT Fellow? Thanks, Mary Ellen, and welcome to everyone. I was um, in a PhD program at the time when you guys initially offered this opportunity, and I thought, well, this is like perfect timing. I was engaged in research for my grad graduate studies, and it seemed like a really natural fit and an opportunity for me to get more experience, especially with the IRB and um, approval process. That was, I had very limited exposure to that. So that was what motivated me to make the application, and I was really excited when it was accepted. Great, thank you. So Tian Hong, why were you interested in being a part of this program? Oh, you're muted. Okay. There you go. Uh, I work with college online instructors and professors on a daily basis, uh, and I would like to share with them the best practices of online teaching and learning, and uh, usually it's evidence-based research, uh, but sometimes it could be hard to convince them. So I thought, like, if I learn how to do research myself and then have that knowledge and then share the evidence-based research, then it will be more um, convincing and easily accepted by college online teachers I'm working with. That's why um, I applied for the program. Great. Thank you. And then Heather, why were you interested in the program? Hi, everyone. Um, so I was interested in getting research experience um, before starting a PhD. So at the time I was um, looking into PhD programs and um, applying for this CDT fellows um, program at the same time. Um, and I just, I knew that the experience would be really good preparation for any research I might be doing in a PhD program. Um, but that's not the only reason, that's the most immediate reason for me. Uh, but before I worked at eCampus, I worked at a community college in California, and I remember reading the report that Mary Ellen referenced earlier, the research preparation and engagement of instructional designers. Um, and I just remember being, um, that was really my first introduction to eCampus and the research unit, and I was just really impressed with the work they were doing, and I, I wanted to be a part of it even back then. Great, thank you. All right. So the next uh, question that I'm going to ask them is I'm going to have them describe the project that they worked on. Now, again, these are these were faculty led projects, but they're going to give you a little summary of of what project they worked on. So let's start with Heather. Uh, so the project I'm working on has to do with um, inclusivity in online computer science courses. Uh, so we know that online learning environments perpetuate gender bias in computer science. And um, our group has, as part of the project, we've developed an inclusive software design learning module for online students. And during the spring, so our, our process is ongoing right now, but during the spring, we, um, we deployed that in a course and we're currently analyzing the data from that module. And so our plan going forward is to revise that module based on our findings and continue gathering data during the fall term. Uh, we aim to measure how completion of this module um, affects how students feel, um, how included they feel in their online courses, uh, how they feel towards others, and then also um, their overall experience of the computer science major. So ultimately, we hope that these findings will help um, inform future research and then also um, give faculty, particularly computer science faculty, some um, additional guidance on how to create these um, online learning classrooms that are more inclusive. Great, thank you. So let's uh, hear from Tian Hong about your project. Okay, so the project uh, I worked with Diana and Michael on was about community engaged research, which uh, I wasn't very familiar with before I participated in this project. Um, 
challenges of doing community engaged research before COVID-19 already existed, like students, graduate students and researchers uh, were having difficulty to be physically in location where data collection happens. For example, when hurricane hits Florida or if it's hits Louisiana, but at Oregon State, if a public health instructor, professor and uh, her graduate uh, student team wants to do research, they have to be physically on site to do the research. We're hoping to find a platform or build a platform that will allow research teams to conduct the research online virtually and then have the participant upload the data and then the researchers will be analyzing the data and create training modules so that will actually benefit uh, uh, people who have been hit by public health disasters such as hurricanes. But to our knowledge, we did an extensive literature review. There wasn't an existing platform that supports the three-way research. The one-way or two-way community engaged research such like citizenship research already exists, but the two-way, three-way wasn't there. So our goal was to evaluating the existing research platforms and what they are doing um, and what we are hoping to do and compare what's missing, what's existing, who's doing well, and then pre, um, pre build a model that's our ideal research platform. And in the future, potentially to build it. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and let's hear from Susan about her project. So the faculty researcher that I was paired with is um, a teacher in the rangeland sciences. And so there's a lot of field work involved in the, you know, the br full breadth of that um, discipline. And um, so that would go to a lot of different conferences and, you know, different um, seminars, things like that. And she frequently got the input from her colleagues in the field that you cannot teach field work um, adequately in an online environment. Well, that's very committed to online learning for a variety of reasons. And she was doing a great job um, developing and teaching online uh, field-based science courses. So she got, tired, she got tired of hearing that complaint and she said, you know, I'm going to actually investigate this and do a little research, you know, let's, let's take a look. And so um, Oregon State happens to have quite a number of courses in rangeland sciences, fisheries and wildlife, and one or two other disciplines where they offer the same course in an online e-campus format as well as the face-to-face on-campus version. And so the um, uh, research project or um, design that Yvette um, and I got to support was regarding com a comparison of the outcomes of the students in those two modalities. Great, thank you so much. So the next question I'm gonna ask of the panelists is how did you contribute to the project or what was your working relationship um, on the project? So let's start with Tian Hong. How did you contribute to your project? Um, I can think about three areas that I contributed to the project. Uh, the first one is reviewing existing research platforms. Every one of uh, the three members of the research team contributed to that, um, just based on our not own special knowledge. Uh, and we did the research uh, literature review online search to find existing research platforms. Uh, and the second area was reviewing learning management systems because what Diana eventually hoped to do was uh, uh, delivering training online virtually uh, so we need to find the, like an uh, online teaching system that's uh, capable um, 
besides doing research. So we, um, because that's my expertise uh, and I've had experience with Blackboard, Moodle, Canvas, and H5P. So I bring, uh, kind of uh, uh, went over the strengths and weaknesses of each system and uh, we looked into the security because uh, um, the the research and especially the public house type of uh, data require high security so um, that makes uh, Canvas or Moodle or Black were not even <laughs> such a good candidate. Uh, so eventually, I think we aimed on H5P where we could do lots of customization and that, that might be a better candidate for uh, delivering training uh, modules. So, so that's my main contribution. The last piece was user interface design. Uh, during that uh, online training delivery, um, Diana had mocked up like what she wants. There's like eight items. She wants uh, like uh, eight buttons on the page where the user could choose. But um, I suggested that for user interface, it the simpler the better. So if you give the user two choices, uh, uh, am I a research participant or am I a researcher? Do I want to join a study or do I want to look for, um, search a study and then read it? So we will just give two choices at the main front entrance. And so that's like a design type of concern. That's where I contributed most. Great. Thank you, Tian Hong. So let's go to Heather next. How did you contribute to the project? Um, well, the first thing I did um, as I joined the project in January, so the first thing I did was I got my IRB training. And then um, my first task with the research group was to review the inclusive design or the inclusive software design learning module that they had created. So I was able to look at it and provide some feedback from an instructional design perspective on that. And then uh, after that, we, we were meeting um, pretty regularly as a group. So uh, we took a look at the survey instrument together and um, kind of brainstorm, brainstormed some revisions and some additional questions to add to that. So I was able to contribute to those conversations. And then um, also just some, some data review and analysis. So we've, um, we usually meet um, on Zoom about once a week and discuss our data. And, um, and then I have a few things outside of that meeting to do. So. Um, I've been able at this point to review um, the data we've gathered. And so our, our working relationship is um, we communicate primarily via email, meet on Zoom. We also use um, Asana to manage our tasks, which is a project management software. And then um, we use Google Drive to kind of organize our documents. And that's how we um, work together primarily. Great, thank you. And Susan, let's hear about you, your contribution. <laughs> Well, when I um, first met the faculty researcher, we, we had never met before. And um, so we didn't know each other, but I was really fortunate that we kind of had an immediate connection and bond. And I think that was really um, helpful because she immediately trusted me and had me um, interacting with the team really as a full partner. She was working with another um, faculty member in her same discipline. And so one of the areas that I was able to really contribute, especially when we were designing the uh, survey instrument, was to think about the questions that were being asked with my instructional designer hat. And so I would often ask questions like, well, what's the purpose of that question? Or what information are you trying to capture by asking that question? And that had um, Yvette and her um, co-researcher um, kind of reevaluate and rethink some of those questions. So um, my, my participation was, I think a little less formal than what Chen Hong and Heather just described, but um, I kind of jumped in and did whatever was needed. I did proofreading, I did, you know, data capture. I had already secured my IRB um, um, certification prior to this, so I was okay to look at the data and stuff. So I got involved at a lot of different levels, but I guess mostly at the development of the survey instrument. Okay, very good. 
Thank you. So the next question I'm going to ask all three of our panelists is what they took from the experience or what did they learn from the experience? So let's start with Heather with that question. Uh, so the, I would say one of my major takeaways at this point, uh, which I imagine as a, I continue on the project, I'll, I'll have more um, experience to rely on. But uh, I would say that one of the thing that, things that stands out to me is that um, it's important to have a lot of diverse perspectives. And so having uh, multiple people as part of the research group means that we all have, you know, something different to contribute. We all have different areas of expertise um, and different backgrounds. And so we all bring something different to the table. Um, and our conversations um, around the data so far have been really rich as a result of our backgrounds and diverse experiences. Well said. Thank you. So Susan, let's hear from you about what you learned from the experience. Yeah, I have to agree um, with what Heather just said, that the diversity of the perspectives was a really valuable element in the work that we did together. I um, appreciated being included as kind of an equal partner without sounding weird. Um, often in my job, as an instructional designer, I'm in a more of a subordinate position to the faculty that I work with. And so it was really um, a different experience to be considered on more equal footing. And um, I think it gave me a deeper perspective as to some of the things that um, the faculty want to consider when they are conducting research. So that was very useful. Okay, great. And I'm glad you mentioned that too, because that was a finding in our um, instructional designer study that um, often uh, the instructional designers would tell us that they felt like they didn't have the credibility to do the research. So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Tian Hong, let's hear from what you learned from the experience. Um, I was um, amazed at the expertise uh, that Diana and Michael brought to the project. Um, Diana is such a data expert, like she built this uh, spreadsheet of uh, data dictionary. Uh, she defined the data with like over 20 um, fields. Like uh, when you look at the data, when you review a system platform, when you look at the data they have, what areas do we need to look at? I, it, it's beyond my imagination that she can come up with so many categories to evaluate um, a data set, whether it's a good quality type of data we want to replicate. So I learned a lot from her, like her attitude and the, is the extent of detail that she went into and the different areas that she think about when we talk about data. And also Michael brought in to the project uh, um, the expertise of uh, data security levels and uh, um, system security levels uh, that I wasn't aware of before. I knew almost like a little about that. And the other thing I learned was about the IRB process, um, the application, the preparation process, the the actual submission and waiting for the approval. We're still waiting for the approval. Uh, we've been hearing uh, two rounds of feedbacks and addressing, uh, addressing that and uh, we're still waiting for our final approval. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we are. Yes, that's, that's always a fun experience, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to kind of reflect on, um, you know, the, the goals of the program and I'm going to have you hear from our faculty partners. Um, so the last question I want to ask is uh, related to the introduction that I gave earlier, which was in our survey, we found out that um, instructional designers often, you know, said their biggest barrier was time. Uh, and time was an issue in terms of, you know, the desire to do research as instructional designers, but not having time. And one of the things that we did in, uh, at eCampus was make sure that we carved out uh, this as a particular role for each of you, uh, even though it's a small part of your role uh, for that period of time. So my question for you is, how did you manage your workload uh, and working with these faculty members? And so I think we'll start with Susan on this one. Thanks. Well, um, 
it, for me, when I was involved in the project, it was very peak and valley. So there would be um, like several hours worth of engagement in a, in a single week. And then I'd go week, several weeks with really nothing going on, be, just by the nature of um, where we were at. So it was relatively easy to end up balancing out across the entire time period at about an hour or so um, a week in, in workload. But definitely it was not slow and steady. It was very like, you know, bursts of activity and then not much. Um, I just kept informed my manager at the time to make sure that, um, you know, I was keeping up with my other projects and other responsibilities and letting her know when I would be spending time on this other aspect. So mostly just good communication. Great. Yeah. And I can also mention that, you know, we, we ask our instructional designer fellows to join those cohort meetings when they can. So they're there with, with those groups when they can be so. And those are about once a term. Okay. So Tian Hong, tell us about how you're managing your workload. Um, I think it was pretty easy to do this because of personal interest and I do my own pro, uh, professional development anyway. So I consider this, this a learning opportunity related to my work. Uh, uh, so it wasn't like so special as other projects. Huh? And also my supervisor support me doing this. Huh? And uh, for the first uh, two months, I think we are meeting every other week, uh, um, once a time, like uh, one, for one hour. And then when we were not meeting, we were researching, we were all reviewing, doing literature review, uh, reviewing the websites and data review and doing these kind of uh, preparation activities. Uh, and when we um, were preparing for the IRB, we had uh, like uh, two consecutive meetings together. We just want to make sure we get that piece done. Um, and Diana contributed the majority of uh, the IRB uh, um, application package uh, uh, because she's most experienced with that. And afterwards, it's like a once a month checkup, so it was really easy. Okay, great, thank you. And then Heather, tell us about how you're managing. Yeah, so um, I'll echo some of the things that Susan and Tian Hong said. I think that communication has been really important, and I've certainly experienced those peaks and valleys. And um, if work is peaking when I'm not busy, that's great. Um, I can I can spend the time that I need to on the project. Uh, I know at least one time uh, I felt like I had a, some work coming from the project and then also some um, other tasks that I had to take care of and I found that just by communicating with the lead researcher and the group there um, everything was fine. Um, and I've also just found that setting clear boundaries is important so you know I've had to I've just referenced um, the, the four hour monthly limit and again it kind of ebbs and flows of course, but I uh, try to stick to that. I know when we were doing data analysis, I could have spent hours reading the data. I was so interested in it. Um, and I had to kind of set my own boundaries on myself and you know make sure that I could um, put that aside and get my other work done. So just kind of being cognizant of that um, and communicating with everyone, my manager and the research team has been important. Great, thank you so much for that. So um, you've heard from our three panelists and, and their experiences. And in the, as we mentioned, they're at different stages in, in this process. Um, and you know, it, it's good to hear from them and hear that uh, I think we are giving them this opportunity to kind of be partners and that they're gaining a lot of experience, but also feeling like they are partners in these research projects. And, and you know, that was our, the goal from the get-go is to kind of carve out a little bit of time. And we don't ask them to put in a lot of time knowing how busy they are, but to carve out a little bit of time to be a part of these research um, processes. And I think it, it, it's been great to see that happen. Um, we asked the faculty partners to provide a little bit of information about um, 
um, you know, what kind of value the instructional designers had brought to their projects. And so I've got some quotes that I'm going to read to you now um, from these uh, faculty partners. And I think it will go to reinforce some of the things that Tian Hong, Heather, and Susan have already said. So here's one quote from our faculty partner. Our research team started as a group of inspired but like-minded scientists wanting to make better online classrooms for diverse students. After she joined the team, the work became credentialed, interdisciplinary, and stronger. She brings expertise and sees what we miss. She not only makes us uh, better able to serve the students we hope to, she makes our team better by adding diversity of thought. And I think that reflects a lot of what Heather uh, has already told us uh, this afternoon. So that was great. Um, the other, another faculty member said the combined knowledge and experience of teaching faculty uh, and an instructional designer is incredibly powerful. She asked many questions throughout the research project, but there was one that added the most value. When I would propose a survey question or a rubric criteria, she would either validate it by explaining its value within the larger research objective and student course process, or would challenge it by pushing me to be clear and specific as to what I was aiming. Part of her ability to do, what, do this was that she viewed the scope of the research and content of the courses involved through a different lens than I did. Uh, she has been trained to look at curricular and course development and design differently. And then the third uh, quote I have is this, the instructional designer provided valuable input on areas of my project. Merging the instructional design with the research is identifying areas to improve online learning. My work with the instructional designer let me explore very practical logistic issues that are often not included in the literature. So I really like those um, statements because I really think they, they have done a lovely job of um, just showing what uh, has come from these partnerships. And I think there's been a great value on both sides. And we were really pleased that, that when I approached all three of these faculty members and said, hey, would you be willing to take on a partner? That they were very willing, they were very excited, and they saw the value even from the beginning uh, on taking on those partners. So. Um, as the administrator of the program, I find that to be um, a good measure of our success, um, that we will, uh, you know, that this is benefiting all parties on all sides of um, our program. And as I mentioned, um, I'm hoping that we can add in some of our multimedia uh, designers as well to future projects, depending on the applications that we get. So that's an area that we're planning um, on expanding. So that's the end of our prepared uh, kind of question and answers. And I'm now wondering if there are questions or comments from our audience, or is there a specific question that you want to ask one of our panelists about the project they worked on? Now would be the time to do that. Um, if you don't mind, can I ask a question just about the, the design of the program? Yes, absolutely. Um, that will go back to the, the very first few slides where you shared mm -hmm. its actionable research. I'm mm -hmm. just curious uh, the difference or similarities between actionable research and action research. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, and you probably have heard that term action research. Um, Actionable research in our case was um, let's let's come up with the research that we need right now to help us make decisions to help us improve learning to help us improve course design. Um, that's kind of how we define actionable research as research that we can um, take and apply right away versus action research, which is often um, when we are uh, in the middle of a course and we're we're. Um, you know, changing things, assessing things, uh, uh, um, looking at how they're working and changing them along the way. So that may be a component of some of these projects, um, but we're talking about it at a little bit broader level in terms of um, the focus of what we want to do with the research that we're doing. So hopefully that helps clarify that. Yes, thank you so much. Great. Um, Emily, I think we have a list of questions for the panelists. Would you mind just pick one and get it started? Yeah, of course. Um, so for Tian Hung and Susan, have you so you've have you ended your time in the program and have you maintained those relationships? Yeah. 
I have ended my time in the program in a formal way. There's one little piece I might get involved in. Um, my faculty researcher has not yet completed the white paper, and I have offered to be a reviewer and an editor for that. But aside from that, it is done. And yes, we have absolutely maintained our relationship. <laughs> As for me, uh, so like I said, mentioned earlier, we are in the process of getting IRB approval. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose it will be approved soon uh, because we've done two revisions and uh, yeah, we've been working um, actively toward getting it approved. Uh, and then we will do the uh, survey. Uh, we'll survey IRB people, staff, will survey uh, instructors, will survey researchers, graduate students, uh, instructional designers, media uh, specialists, uh, and to get their um, contributions. Uh, what do they think of a future platform might look like? Uh, so that will be the next step. Once we had those survey results, then we'll uh, analyze the data and then write the report. So I'm still like... Uh, um, in the midst of it. Yeah, in the middle of that <laughs> process. Mm -hmm. um, one of our other questions, Susan, you mentioned that uh, the feeling of being on equal footing with the faculty partner. And we were wondering if um, the three of you fellows have any ideas for how to replicate that partnership broadly so it always feels that way? Or is it just something that's kind of like right time, right place? Are there strategies we can apply as instructional designers? Well, I'll start, even though it's the question for all of us. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, it naturally evolved in my experience at, on the research team. It was just sort of how it happened. But in my day-to-day -day job, I think I do have to be more um, deliberate about establishing those um, foundations for trust and rapport and collaboration. Um, the confidence that I gained from the research experience, knowing that I could contribute um, well, was helpful to me when I've encountered some resistance to that more equal um, footing in other arenas. So I think it definitely contributed for me personally in my ability to take that experience and leverage it in other um, situations. And I could share a little bit of my own personal um, story about this. I think my attitude or my mindset changed a little bit. Uh, I started working as a um, full-time instructional designer for online courses uh, um, at college in 2006. Uh, back um, at Purdue University. And uh, I work for the distance learning office. I am the only instructional designer at that office. So when people, they apply to develop their course, redevelop their course and the distance office support funds their project and, uh, and they assign me to assist them. And uh, I'm working with these professors and engineering faculty member or education uh, researchers. And uh, sometimes I feel like uh, um, I know I, I, I have my degree from instructional design and uh, I started, I finished all the coursework for a PhD program because of family sickness. I had to uh, just uh, start a full-time job. So I quit that. PhD program, but still I feel like somewhat in my, um, maybe it's just personal doubt, I wasn't confident enough if people challenge me, like where does this best practice coming from, then I will search up and, uh, and find other people's quotes to support myself. I couldn't just say, oh, I know for sure this is best practice because of this and that. I always kind of feel like I have to find other voices to support me. So that was my 
mindset uh, when I worked at Purdue University. Then I went to work uh, in Minnesota for a short period of time. My work switched a little bit to a more LMS uh, administrator supporting the migration. When I came to OSU in 2014, I became very interested in evidence-based evidence research. So I started to read a lot about um, the articles and the books on neuroscience, on evidence-based teaching. Um, I read a lot and I like do my own summary and I save these papers and uh, whenever I came across with a research article or a book, I summarized it and uh, I cite it and I email it to a few instructors, I feel like this will be most relevant. So it has become a practice, my daily practice. Whenever I come across a piece of research, I feel like I can use it in my uh, course design, then I share it. Like uh, the instructor, Yvette Gibson, that Susan worked with, actually, I worked with her on many course designs. Uh, I shared with her about open educational resources, convinced her to start writing her own textbook with her student team. And I encouraged her to uh, do other things like uh, uh, student enabled content and the map engaged like using a timeline and the map uh, having student uh, to select a certain content and the create provide the content create the content and share the content if that is a super like open-minded instructor she will take these suggestions uh, look into the research resources i provided and apply them and there are many other instructors like that. So I do share and I know where my best practice is coming from. So I become more confident when I work with uh, my instructors. Now, I do not feel like I'm subordinate. I, I feel like when I talk to a professor in mathematics, I know nothing about math, but I still feel like I'm very confident in what I'm sharing because I know where the research comes from and I can pull them very easily out if you need a piece of evidence. So that's where I stand currently. Um, and I'll agree with Susan and Tian Hong and say that I definitely think being well versed in the research and well read is important to kind of having that equal footing with faculty. Um, and I will just add that I think a lot of that um, stems from the fact that faculty don't always understand what we do Mm -hmm. And I think eCampus does a really good job of positioning instructional designers as experts, um, but that's not the case everywhere. And, um, and that's, you know, sometimes just um, faculty haven't had the opportunity to work with an instructional designer before and to know what we do. So I think a part, something that helps me is explaining um, what my role is and how we're going to work together. Yeah, and I will add that I think that that made it easier for me as the program lead to then go to these faculty and say, hey, here's what we're going to do. What do you think about this? You know, um, you know, having this reputation of our team being as it is and, um, you know, that, that we were actually positioning these applicants at the time as, you know, credible and, um, you know, uh, you know, having great background in some of these areas and being a real positive addition to these projects made it really easy for me to make the case that hey you should do this uh, and it was it was it was easy to do that great question thank you for your insight on there the kind of a follow-up to that um i know that a lot of time instructional designers can i don't know I don't know how to phrase it other than, did you ever have an, a, a moment when you disagreed with your faculty member and how did you handle that? That's probably the best way I can ask that question. <laughs> Great question. Well, I'll jump in again. Um, definitely, there were times when, you know, a vet wanted to go in a particular direction and I would do, like I said earlier, I would ask the question, well, what's the purpose of that? Or what do you want to get at by, you know, doing that or asking that? And um, it was always very respectful and she appreciated sort of my putting a pause up, like to ask her to think about 
the reasoning behind something rather than just assuming that um, that was the right direction to go. And so that was how we handled it. We taught, and if there was any uncertainty, like, if, well, why would, I, why would I not want to do that? Then I would, you know, explain in deeper detail about why I was questioning that and what, why it didn't automatically feel like it was connected to the end goal that she was trying to accomplish. So again, it goes back to good communication. Well, I have several examples. Um, one example, I was working with a College of Business uh, professor. He's an associate professor in his own research, uh, in his own research area in um, log logistic management, uh, or they may have a different term for that. That's what, what, how I understand his specialty is. And he refused to do a instructor introduction video for all the three or four courses I collaborated with him. The first time I, um, I suggested, uh, hey, uh, you will be recording these uh, voiceover lectures and uh, there's the exam and the quizzes and discussion. Uh, would you consider like uh, doing a video actually show you uh, to, the, uh, to your students? He said, no, I don't need that. Okay, so I find some research and I shared like how instructor presence could uh, increase uh, on the student and the instructor relationship and motivate student to ask questions and uh, uh, be more um, productive or motivated to learn in the course and he did nothing. So I let it by. Um, the second time, the second time I work with him again, I brought up the topic again, and he, he said, "Oh, maybe I'll think about it." But by the end of the development, he still didn't do any recording, uh, do our instructor introduction recording. And the third time, still no, but I've shared enough, and he understands, but he still refused to do. That's one example. And of course, I have many examples of success, like uh, sharing a strategy and the instructor actually um, takes it and uh, applies it. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, uh, like uh, Yvette, what I shared with her on OER and uh, the student uh, generated content, and she just loves that. Uh, um, those ideas and applied in her course. And there's a biology zoology instructor. She invited me to do research with her on um, metacognition, how to help students improve learning. So those are successful stories. And But I also have some unsuccessful stories. <laughs> there was another instructor, I think it was an engineering instructor. So in his course, there was a lecture and a quiz, a, a final exam. And I was trying to convince him to do um, like the weekly quizzes instead of a big giant final exam. Uh, somehow um, he refused to do that. He said that would be too much grading or he refuses to add the weekly discussions because he didn't want to deal with the grading. I eventually contact at that time Shannon Riggs is still like uh, our director for instructional design team CDT team so I emailed Shannon and the Shannon get involved and I emailed the instructor with more research and more evidence uh, um, but somehow the instructor dropped the ball and didn't complete the project uh, and pretty much uh, it will be hard for us to support him to doing a new course development that way um yeah so that was just uh, uh, a failed project um uh, but we still stick to our rules like we want the best most active most engaged student learning experience uh, when you come to eCampus to look for support and funding to do a course development we don't want to put a very like uh, how do you say, one directional uh, student learning experience. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, lonely student learning experience course, uh, yeah. That makes sense. Heather, any thoughts on um, what to do when you get faculty pushback? Um, 
I'll just say that I think, you know, keeping the dialogue open and, um, and just trying to hear them out. I mean, sometimes they, they may have a reason for wanting to do something that I don't understand either. So um, I think just being open and, and not expecting there to be one solution, but that there's always different ways, um, different options. And so um, even something we end up with may not be exactly what I would have hoped, but um, it's probably better than what it was um, proposed to be initially. So just um, being open, I think is important. Thank you. We have a handful of questions that are more around logistics. So maybe Mary Ellen, this, these might be more for you. Um, did the faculty receive a course release for participating in this program? Oh, I think you're still on mute. I'm sorry, I muted. Um, no, they did not. Um, and that's why we, we set some pretty strict boundaries around the amount of time that they spent in this. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, was the question about the faculty? The faculty. Oh, the faculty, right. I thought, I thought the question was about the instructional designer fellows. Yes, in some cases, it depends on the project. Some of the faculty decided to um, use some of the funds for faculty FTE. In some cases, that wasn't possible or they didn't want that. So from project to project, that really varied. But many of the projects do um, include some FTE for the, for the faculty member. Excellent. Um, and then just kind of our last one, um, did, did, the, did the ISDs already have a relationship with the faculty or are these people who, how were the people chosen for the um, faculty partnerships? So we put out an application for the okay. course development and training team, um, which is the instructional designers are a part of that team and they would apply and uh, we would select the um, applicant based on their qualifications and also based on um, a matching. So we would look at what are the who are the fellows that we're um, admitting into the program for this year, what are their projects and what might be a really good match in terms of research interests um, and expertise. And so we did a bit of a matching um, system to do that. And so, um, no, in, in many cases, the, the instructional designers and the faculty did not know each other before we embarked on this project. Thank you. And Weiwei? Thank you. Um, yeah, we, I'm just watching the time. We're actually one minute over. So okay. thank you all to our uh, panelists for sharing your experience and stories and leading this great conversation. It really gives us, all of us, either as IDs or faculty or support staff, a lot to think about, especially as instructions are moving online during COVID. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today, especially in such a warm day. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out either to me directly or to our panelists and I really look forward to seeing you in our August sessions. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.